Bom dia a todos. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Much has been said and written about personal success. We've had some eloquent speakers speak about their own experience. About corporate success. On the shelves of bookshops, you will find all kinds of titles such as how to become a millionaire, how to successfully manage all aspects of your life. You will have CEOs boasting about what they did at the helm of their companies and trying to sell advice to other CEOs. But what you will not find, most probably, is a self-help book designed for world leaders in telling them how to run successfully their country. And it's a pity because it's a fascinating theme. Why is it that some countries are thriving when others are going through a very bad time? This is a subject that interests me particularly because in my professional life, I'm a financial consultant, and a lot of that is sovereign risk assessment. In other words, is it safe and a good idea to invest in the bonds of a government of a particular country? And is it even safe to invest in that country? But then on a personal level, I do a lot of traveling, and I'm often struck when I travel, like everyone else, I like to see the sights and the landscapes and try the food and meet the people, but I like to observe, observe and compare. And there are some countries that really strike me as working well. And I keep asking myself, but why are they working well? What is the secret of their success? To try and find an answer to this question, allow me to take you on a little tour around the world in 15 minutes. I have selected four countries on four continents that are success stories. The first one is Singapore in Southeast Asia. The second one is Switzerland in the heart of Europe. Then we have Rwanda in the middle of Africa. And finally, Barbados, a Caribbean island in the Americas. You might know some things about these countries. Let me add a few details to show how successful they are. Let me start by Singapore. Now, Singapore, five decades ago, was a backwater. There was nothing much and nothing to distinguish Singapore from its immediate neighbors. Today, Singapore is one of the world's most stunning success stories. I can give you hundreds of statistics. Let me just give you a few. It's the only country in Asia to have a AAA rating by the three rating agencies. It has a gross domestic product per capita of $60,000. But the number itself doesn't mean much. What's interesting is the relative success. How does that compare with its neighbors? Well, on average, every citizen of Singapore is four times richer than his neighbor in Malaysia to the north and 12 times richer than his neighbor to the south in Indonesia. Quite a success. Switzerland is a success story. You hear only good news about Switzerland whenever you hear, do hear news. The word deficit does not exist in the Swiss vocabulary or dictionary. They don't have budget deficits. They don't have trade deficits. Everything seems to be going well for them. Let's go down to the other two examples, Barbados. Now, you might be surprised, most people think of Barbados as an emerging country or a developing country. According to the IMF GDP per capita, and I'm talking about the April 2012 numbers, so they're very recent, Barbados actually is a rather prosperous country. It is number 40 in the ranking of countries. And do you know who's number 41? Portugal. So Barbados is actually richer per capita than Portugal is. And, just as surprisingly, in the Human Development Index, which is a composite index that takes into account standard of living, but also education, life expectancy, literacy, Barbados, together with Argentina and Chile, is one of the only three Latin American countries that is part of the category highly developed countries. Now for the last one, and I'm sure you're always wondering, what is Rwanda doing on the list of successful countries? Well, Rwanda is more than a successful country. I'd say 
it's not a success case, it's a miracle case. Juanda has everything against it. It is overpopulated, it's got about 12 million people living on an area which is smaller than the province of Alentejo. It is landlocked, which means it is far from any ocean, which is a huge handicap in a globalized world. In fact, to bring a container from Kigali, the capital, to the closest harbor, which is Mombasa in Kenya, takes 72 hours and adds an extra $1,000 per container of cost. And then the recent history. There was a gruesome civil war in Rwanda in 1994 that culminated in the genocide that led to the death of nearly 1 million people in 100 days. The country was absolutely on its knees, but its recovery has been amazing. Not only is the country really peaceful, but it has prospered. A few numbers. Extreme poverty used to be 65% five years ago. It's now reduced to 45%. That's a huge improvement in such a short time. 80% of the population now has access to safe water. And the literacy rate is over 75%. It means simply that three out of four Rwandans can read and write today. Now, the interesting thing is to compare, compare with other countries. And with Rwanda, it's very easy because it has a neighbor to the south called Burundi. Let me just try and show it on the map, just below, which makes for easy comparisons because they have approximately the same population, the same land area, the same climate, the same resources. In Rwanda, three quarters of the population can read and write. In Burundi, only half of men and one quarter of women. And if we look at the GDP figures, although the GDP of Rwanda is less than $1,500 per year per inhabitant, which is very low, it is still more than two and a half times that of Burundi. So why is it? Why is it that those four countries and others have succeeded when others have not? Before we look at the main pillars of their success, let's try and see what are the characteristics they share. Well, the characteristics they share, the main ones, actually the absence of characteristics. Let me explain. Many people think that for a country to be successful, it makes it easier if they have natural wealth, natural resources. Well, none of these countries have any abundant natural resources. No oil fields, no gold mines. The other mistake a lot of people do often when they think about sovereign success is to think that to run a country, if you only have one race, one language, one religion, it makes things much easier. Well, that's not the case. Think of Switzerland. You've got 80% of the population who speak German, 60%, sorry. You've got 20% who have French as a native tongue, and then you have those who speak Italian and then another dialect. You have Catholics, you have Protestants. All those people have been living together very well for the nine, last 900 years. Singapore, same kind of mix. About two-thirds of the population are ethnically Chinese, and then you have significant minorities of both Malays and Indians. So you have three languages, four with English. You have four alphabets. Can you imagine what the public signs look like in Singapore? So no, the secret of success for countries goes well beyond that. And some people could argue that they got their industrial policies right or they fixed their social security system. But in my opinion, it's down to three things. Keep low corruption, protect the environment, and provide excellent education to your population. Let's start by the low corruption. Low corruption is particularly important. It's not only the feeling of fairness than ev that everyone has when there is less corruption. It's also that a country that has little corruption is a country where investors will more gladly come. In that regard, you will not be surprised that Singapore is one of the least corrupt countries in the world. There's an index. It's called the Corruption Perception Index that exists and that ranks countries in the world according to how corrupt their public service is perceived to be. Singapore is right at the top. It's number five after New Zealand and the Scandinavian countries. Singapore is a place where no one will ask you for a bribe. It's super clean. Very much on top, Switzerland, you would expect it. It ranks number nine in the Corruption Perception Index. But then we, we have a few surprises coming. 
Barbados. Barbados is ranked number 16. That's out of, out of 180 countries. In fact, it means that Barbados is the least corrupt country in the Americas after the US and Canada. As a matter of reference, let, re let me remind you or tell you that Portugal ranks number 32. But even more surprising is Rwanda. I mean, Rwanda is a very, very poor country, and it ranks number 49 in the world. Now, that's pretty impressive when you compare it to its neighbor to the south, Burundi, which ranks 172nd. But it's even more impressive when you look at statistics from Europe. Italy ranks number 69. Let me just remind you that Rwanda was 49, and Greece is ranked number 80. So Rwanda is actually perceived to be much less corrupt than many big European nations. No small feat for a country that was on its knees 18 years ago. The environment. The environment is something essential, and I'll tell you a little bit of a little story about Rwanda. I was there on two occasions in the last years, and I entered the country through its land borders, once from the south in Uganda, and once from the one from the north in Uganda, and once from the south in Burundi. And on both occasions, my luggage was searched at customs. And I wondered, you know, that's a bit strange. Are they trying to extract a bribe? Do they think I'm a smuggler? And then I understood what they were looking for. Do you know what they were looking for? They were looking for plastic bags. Because Rwanda, in spite of being one of the poorest countries of the world, is the only one to have banned totally plastic bags, which are a huge nuisance for the environment, and to enforce the ban so that when they do find you with a plastic bag, they just confiscate it and provide you free of charge with a paper bag. But Rwanda's care for the environment goes much further. If you walk the streets of Kigali, its capital, you will notice that it's incredibly clean. It's Switzerland-like clean. Very nice and unusual feeling when you're in Africa. And then they take very good care of their wildlife. It's one of the few remaining spots in the world, in fact, the last, where there are mountain gorillas. We saw some pictures of mountain gorillas earlier. And a national park, the Parc des Volcans, has been established, which is run in a remarkable way that benefits the local communities with a very special ecotourism that is very, very successful. Switzerland very good with the environment too. I mean, we know, all know how clean Switzerland is, but did you know that it was the world's top recycler by far, with a very unusual and intelligent measure that taxes families on the number of household garbage bags that they use. So there's much less waste in Switzerland than anywhere else in the world. And then Barbados has an excellent record when it comes to the environment, although with measures that will not easily make headlines in the newspapers, it has an ex excellent system of protecting the catchment areas that will enable the underground aquifers to keep the water clean and guarantee safe water for the population. It has a state-of-the-art sewage system that avoids any contamination to the coral reef, and the coral reef that surrounds the island is essential for its tourism industry. And then there is Singapore. Singapore has a state-of-the-art public transport system and it has a very intelligent way of taxing cars and taxing the usage of roads so that you don't really need a car in Singapore. In fact, in spite of being the wealthiest country in the world, only one in 10 families in Singapore own or use a car. The result? Much less congestion, much less pollution. Singapore is much less polluted than any other similar city in Asia. Now, let, let us come to education, the third and very important pillar. Education is long-term thinking. It's a hands-on approach. And it's not the kind of policy that will get a politician re-elected. When you invest in education, it takes 20 years to show. And the electoral cycles are four or five years. So you need to think ahead, and you need to be brave. Let me start by a little story about Bar Barbados. I have met on several occasions Barbadians who live in Europe. They're working in the High Commission in London or the Embassy in Brussels. And when I asked them if they were happy to be living in Europe, they said, yeah, sure they were, but they missed their children. So I said, so where are your children? Oh, we left them behind in Barbados. And I said, but why would you do that? Well, 
correctly explained, we are public servants of a middle-income country, and we have decent salaries, but not enough to pay for private schools for our children, and we would never put our children in a state school in England or in continental Europe. The level is so low. And in fact, Barbados has one of the best schooling systems in the world, academic excellence. Um, Singapore. Singapore has innovated in education maybe more than any other country. A few decades ago, it took this incredible measure. It decided that all teaching, right down from primary school all the way up to university, should be done in English only. Now, there are two reasons for this measure. The first is that Singapore is a trading nation. In a globalized world, if you master English, you're much, much better off than your competitors. But the, but the other is that it's a multi-ethnic country with different races speaking different languages. By creating artificially a second mother tongue common to all the citizens, it enabled those ethnic groups to communicate with each other much better. And I can promise you it works. If you're sitting in the metro in Singapore and it's just past four o'clock and the schools have closed and you have a bunch of kids sitting next to you and they'll be from Indian, from Malay, from Chinese background and they're all chattering together, they do it in English. It comes naturally. English has become a real second mother tongue. And exactly the same happens in Rwanda. As Pre President Kagame of Rwanda often says, he wants his country to become the Singapore of Africa. And he's done exactly the same thing. When Rwanda became independent in 1962, it was a Belgian colony, so that French was the official language. Now, French is not as useful as English in a globalized world, but even less when all your immediate neighbors, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, are English speaking. So he simply changed. The official language of Rwanda is no longer French, it is English. And every kid has all his schooling or her schooling in English, right from primary school all the way to university. One last word about Switzerland and its educational system. It's controversial because a little bit like the German system, it selects pupils at a very young age to, to determine which are the ones that will go towards university and academic studies and the ones that will go through professional training. But in order to decide if an educational system works or doesn't work, one simple statistic. As you know, Switzerland is surrounded by the European Union. In February of this year, the average unemployment rate in the European Union was 10.5%. In Switzerland, bang in the middle, it was 3.5%. And this is in spite of Switzerland having the highest salaries in the world. They've got to be doing something right. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I'm well above my 15 minutes. In my humble opinion, the three keys and pillars to sovereign success are low corruption, good care of the environment, and excellent education. Thank you so much.